When the woman is empowered, the family does better. The children have a better education and their futures are better. India has always had a global outlook. We say Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam and it was our slogan in G20 and we contributed a lot to G20 with this slogan. It feels like now we are waking up to the opportunities and potential of Bharat. Many Indians went to MIT because one of the Maharajas, I think it was the Maharaja of Bhavnagar, funded many students and his Prime Minister was a disciple of Gandhi. Mr. Godrej, it's an honor to be here. And you know, while I was coming inside Godrej One and this campus, it also, you know, many thoughts came to my mind. And one was that how huge, how large, how big. Second was in Mumbai. Uh, third was, uh, you know, out of India, in our country. So uh, it's an honor to be talking to you. And I would love to begin this conversation, uh, take you down the memory lane and ask, what does it take to be here? What does it take to build an iconic brand like Goodrich. As you know, our company is 126 years young, as we like to say. And it started way back with my grand uncle, Ardeshar Goodrich, uh, who, although he was a lawyer, uh, once he had to fight a case in Zanzibar, and because he refused to lie, he lost the case. And uh, then he gave up the law, and one day he was speaking to Mahatma Gandhi and he says, you're talking about independence, but this country doesn't have an economy. How can it be independent? So Mahatma Gandhi told him, what are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. So we started our business. We happened to be in consumer products while most other Indian business people were in infrastructure or textiles and industries such as that. So very early we developed a brand and our founders themselves developed the brand. They always insisted that we should develop trust, uh, customer centricity, uh, honesty were our principles and that helps to build a brand and that brand can be extended to other products such as real estate and which you can see uh, over here and of course we do real estate projects all over the country in, but largely in large cities. So that's how our brand was built up and we hope that uh, we will continue to maintain this focus on customer centricity and maintain a successful brand. Yeah, you know, I'm just saying that they, there'd be any, hardly any Indian who wouldn't know Godrej. But most importantly, when you, you know, say the word Godrej, there is a trust. There is a, a certain resonance, that con a connection. Like, uh, um, it's not easy to continuously uh, be so loved. Right, right. Uh, you have to be consistent, you have to walk the talk. As you said, it's not easy, but it uh, pays to stay on the path because the benefits are great as well. Yeah. Right now, I don't know if you're following the starter world. Uh, there has been a lot of questions on the valuation versus the value creation. So I'm just saying that what do you think can the corporate world take from the startup world and what can startup world take from the corporate? What we can take from the startup world is uh, rapid innovation. What they can uh, uh, take from us is don't be too hasty. <laughs> <laughs> There's often an attempt to become a unicorn very fast and then some of these companies collapse. I was just seeing the movie about WeWork yeah. where they reached 45 billion in valuation and next day they were bankrupt. So how does that help anyone? Yeah. So startups uh, must stay the course. And we, of course, can work faster, but without losing our values. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm just coming back to is in terms of valuation, like there is such a such a focus on uh, creating fastest valuation. Do you think in the tech world that we are in, it's easier to get that vis-a-vis -vis in the non-tech world? Definitely it is because uh, in our kind of old business world, uh, economies come with scale. Yeah. 
in the new business world, economies come with network effects. Yes. And uh, scale follows a two-third exponential power law, which is good. The bigger the scale is, your costs come down, but it's not dramatic. But economics of networks is it's proportional to the number of nodes. Yes. It's like if you have n nodes, the benefits are n squared. So the more nodes you get, the benefits get greater and greater. That's why this compulsion to grow very fast, whether you're profitable or not, and convince people that you're going to get huge network effects and create great value. But as we discussed, the problem with that is you may not be creating any value at all. Your uh, network effect may be zero. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you must have some useful proposition in the network. And if you have that, we have seen like Amazon or Google or Microsoft, there are huge benefits. Yeah. Apple. <laughs> you know, so what would you say to all the young people today who are looking at starting their businesses? What should be their metrics, not start? Yes, they should look at all opportunities, but I would urge them to do things that are socially good. Yeah. Because if you are doing something socially good, and God knows there are uh, many causes that we have to fight for, if you're fighting inequality, if you're uh, uh, trying to become inclusive, if you're trying to solve for climate change, these are huge opportunities where you can do huge benefits to society and... Uh, you can be very successful. Yeah. So I would urge them to look at socially good businesses and there are many, many opportunities. And it's, oh, it's also very purposeful. I mean, it's, it's very purposeful. Yeah. It will give you satisfaction yes. and it, it's bound to be successful in the long run if you have good ideas and you're actually giving value in these themes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Godrich, I'd love to talk to you about Bharat because we have India and now we are talking about Bharat and it feels like now we are waking up to the opportunities and potential of Bharat. How do you see? Well, uh, uh, for me, there are uh, synonyms. Uh, there are words in different languages. Uh, for instance, uh, Venice has different names in different uh, languages. In German, they say Venerich. In French, they say Venise. In Italian, they say Venezia. And of course, in English, we say Venice. So one thing is that names can be different in different languages. Now, do the names in the native language have different connotations? That's a different question. In your mind, does Bharat have a different connotation than India? In some minds, it does. So uh, that can also be the case. But as, as far as I'm concerned, whether we call it India or Bharat, there are opportunities. Yeah. And India is a very fast growing economy, uh, one of the, f definitely the fastest large economy, probably the fastest economy in the world currently, though I wouldn't rule out some small economy growing faster for a little while. So we have a lot of potential and uh, we have a lot of potential in looking within ourselves and within our country. But India has always had a global outlook. We say Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam yes. and it was our slogan in G20 and we contributed a lot to G20 with this slogan and we should continue believing that and get the whole world together, hopefully peacefully. Unfortunately, we have a lot of warfare right now. If India can contribute to producing peace, peace in the world, it would be a wonderful thing and uh, we should look at this message, which is a wonderful message in home also, and try to make sure that all of India is one family. Uh, if we all work together within India, the sky's the limit. I also think we need to be much more inclusive. Uh, for instance, women's participation in the economy is quite low. It's very high, for example, in Tamil Nadu, where they have been empowering women for a very long time. We need to do it everywhere because that helps the economy and it also helps the family. When the woman is empowered, the family does better. The children have a better education and their futures are better. And the daughters of powerful women are going to be powerful women. So I think this is a very important thing we need to do. Our growth rate, which is seven to 8%, could easily go to 10% if we are more inclusive and particularly if we get more women in the workforce safely, we ensure women's safety. One of the reasons women are not 
uh, very actively in the wake, uh, workforce is because we are not ensuring their safety. The government has done a great job in sanitation, which is empowering uh, girls to go to school more than before. And uh, we are making slow progress on malnutrition, which is holding us back. We should be work faster on malnutrition. If all our children have good nutrition and learn well, the future will be great. And then we wouldn't uh, have so much of a difference between Bharat and India. Yes, then yes. we wouldn't have so much of a difference. And really, there should be no difference. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. If, if we believe in Vasudeva Kutak, Kutumbakam, Bharat is part of the universe. Yes, yes. <laughs> I also want to understand from you is that, you know, when we were growing up, we've always looked at West for higher studies, education. And of course, now India has also, you know, we have such amazing institutions over here. To all the young people, where do you see in the new tech digital world, how should they be thinking about their careers? As I said earlier, they, they should not think short term, they should think long term, they should do things that are fulfilling, purposeful, uh, useful to society, and that gives them satisfaction. And uh, many of the young people are doing that. I'm surprised at how many young people are working for social causes, yeah. sometimes in the non-profit world, yeah. sometimes running social businesses for profit. And I really commend them for doing that. And the only thing I would urge them to is think more long term. Yeah. And you're saying that the boundaries of going abroad to study or yes. here is not that. No, there's lots of opportunities here. And I'm very pleased there are a lot of broad universities like Ashoka University or Ahmedabad University where I delivered the convocation address. Uh, I was very impressed by Ahmedabad University. I think it's very dangerous if we are only thinking in silos that we can't properly interact with people from other backgrounds. And we have to work in teams. And if we don't understand what the other team members are saying, it's not a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Godrich, I want to ask you, and I'm sure everyone would love to know, is that, you know, the India you grew in and the India where you started working to now the India where you are leading and Godrich is leading is like, what are some of the changes that you feel particularly proud of? Yes. And what are some of the things that you think that we could still do better? Yes, I feel uh, particularly proud of the liberalization of 91. Uh, perhaps uh, IMF and World Bank held a gun to our heads and forced us to do it. Uh, but Narasimha Rao and Manmohan Singh did a very good job. And in the economics of India, everything changed. Yeah. The growth rate, the first few years were difficult. Because what happened was that when the license Raj ended, we had suddenly lots of opportunity, but lots of threats as well. But in life, any such crisis is for the best, because at the end of the day, the opportunities outweigh the threats. Yeah. So we could go into new businesses. Uh, we could expand as much as we wanted. Of course, we had to face more competition. We had to face more foreign competition. More Indian companies were competing, but competition only made us stronger and made the economy stronger. So that, to my mind, was a very big change, a change for the good. And governments since then have constantly been going on the reform path. Sometimes, of course, they slow down. Like right now, exports of onions have been banned, rice has been banned, wheat has been banned, probably in preparation for the elections. As long as our economy is free, that's very good. Also, some subsidies are not really useful, like the urea subsidy forces farmers to overuse nitrogen fertilizer. Then there are pollution problems. So our subsidies also, I'm not against subsidies, but the subsidies should be properly planned so that they don't get abused and they really encourage economic growth, not to incentivize wrong behavior. So we should be careful about that. Other than that, uh, and I already made the point of in inclusiveness, I think we are on the right path. As long as we uh, be careful about subsidies, are more inclusive, our economic growth is already very good, and there's no reason why we can't grow at 10% a year. Do you, do you miss something of India, of 
few decades back, which could be brought well, back. <laughs> I joined business in 76 and from 76 to 91, Bombay was an extremely quiet city. There was hardly any event. Whatever event there was, we would attend. Now we have to choose between a hundred events, what to attend, what to do. Things have completely changed. I would say largely for the better. Another uh, problem I should mention is air pollution. Yeah. That has definitely become worse. And in Mumbai, pretty much in the last year. Oh, yes, last yes, year? yeah, last one year. During the pandemic, we didn't have much of a problem with air, perhaps a little bit before that. And brings me to the city of Mumbai. You know, it has, to me, it is, you know, a, a representation of India. Uh, and it's, you know, it's standing, it's strong, it's resilient, it's amazing, it's cultural, it's diverse, it's beautiful and it's life and hopeful. Like, you know, I had come, like for me, my career started over here ah. and, I, and uh, it, it, it makes you professional, it makes yes. you who you are. I'd love to know from you, Mr. Godridge, because, you know, Godridge is here, you are here. What does Mumbai mean to you? Uh, Mumbai to me is a very cosmopolitan city, it's home. I was born in Mumbai. Other than my student life, I've lived all my life in Mumbai. And um, uh, you studied my, outside, no? I studied at uh, MIT, Stanford, and Harvard Business School, wow. uh, mostly in Boston. You didn't leave anything. One <laughs> academic vacation in California for one year, <laughs> where I did my masters in the beautiful climate of California, and wow. also uh, happened to meet my wife. Uh, wow though many years before we got married, but the rest of my life was spent in Mumbai. And it's a very cosmopolitan city, very international city, uh, probably more organized than the rest of India. So let's hope that Mumbai always have a balance between some kind of discipline and order. Mr. Godrej, now I want to ask you, are you working with Gen Z today? And what would you tell them? Because the Gen Z workforce, everyone is today, you know, like there's so much of conversation happening of working from office, working from home. How do you work? During the pandemic, I got quite used to working from home. And I'm still a proponent of working from home. I know the IT industry is having big arguments of, and we also now have most people working from here. Though we do have some amount of flexibility that we give our workers. And they do appreciate that. And I'm in favor of that. Uh, as long as you can measure output, it, there's no reason to insist that people come here. Of course, when you're at an office, uh, you have things like the water cooler effect yes. and so on happening, which when you're working from home, you miss out on. But even if you come one or two days to the office and work from home, I have no objection to that. I'm not sure all my CEOs would <laughs> agree with that, but that's my own personal feeling. And I would urge uh, Gen Z people to be flexible if their companies permit them and if they are founders of companies, they can decide <laughs> how it should be run. Uh, the advantage is that you can have a good work-life balance also. Yeah. Uh, you can take a little bit of time off to do home tasks, then come back to office tasks. As long as you're dedicated and you do your office work properly, uh, I, I, I always think that work-life balance is important. And I don't think I agree with Nara and Murthy that Gen Z should work for 70 hours a week. <laughs> You know, I'm sure everyone listening would be loving this <laughs> and would love yes. what you said. I, I but must, what you're saying is output should be measured. Output That's should be it. measured. Yeah. Output should be measured. How you do it. And work should be done in a focused manner. But a lot of time should be spent on other things. And if I were always working, I wouldn't have time to make my speeches in verse <laughs> <laughs> or follow my other hobbies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, that's what I want to ask you, that you are a man of so many interests and you're so good at it. Yes. And I've heard your uh, poems, I've had the fortune of hearing it at many forums. How do you, like, you know, because most of us feel job 24-7 goes into it and we get so worked up about the work. Or then we, have, we, we most people don't even have time to exercise regularly. Right. And... And we say, oh, Mr. Godrich can afford to do it. We can't. Right. But I just want to ask you, 
that uh, if you had to say, how have you managed to do this? Perhaps I'm not spending enough time at my work. I'll admit that first of all. But for me, exercise is very important. So I exercise regularly. Uh, and I think I wouldn't be uh, healthy if I didn't exercise. I'm uh, 72 years old, but I'm still quite fit. So I walk every day. I try to walk uh, 10,000 steps a day at least, yes. And three or four times a week, I like to swim. And I, if I go swimming, I swim for a kilometer. During the pandemic, I couldn't swim much, but I was walking even more. And uh, four or five times a week, I do yoga. Then I'm interested in music, theater. When I was at MIT, I used to act in theater. I took some drama courses. My father was always interested in very different things. He was interested in history, geography. He knew all the countries. He knew a lot about history. And he used to shave for about 40 minutes. And I used to go into the bathroom and talk to him at that time. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so that it was very good father-son time. And my mother was very interested in literature. My grandmother was a poet. So from the, I got all these influences to follow different things. My father was a chemist, so I became a chemical engineer. And I loved the fact that I had all these different in, interests. And I find that this broad knowledge helps me tremendously. So, so how do you have so many interests and there's so much of liveliness and life in you about everything? Because of all these interests, it makes me lively. <laughs> <laughs> Were you always like that? I was always like that, thanks to my father. And he, the way to remember things is, is connected. He would connect history with geography. If you know the exact geography of a battle, you remember the battle very well. And if you know the social consequences of uh, something, then you remember that. And right now, uh, when we see how Hamas attacked Israel, and then um, Israel uh, uh, attacked Hamas, and so many civilians were killed by Israel. And on the one hand, you can argue that uh, Hamas is sheltering under civilians. So how can Israel attack Hamas without killing civilians? But is it really in Israel's interest to kill all these civilians? Yeah. Maybe they'll destroy Hamas. But one of Hamas's objectives seemed to be to create lots of shaheeds. There was a US congressman who said that for every thousand civilians uh, killed, there are 100,000 terrorists cre created. So is Israel doing the right thing? And then I remember what Talena said when the Napoleon killed the Duke d'Anguin. So he said, it is worse than a crime, it's a blunder. And when you look at history from that perspective, you remember all these things and you learn a lot. So blunders are worse than crimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and crimes are, in fact, crimes are almost always blunders. <laughs> But Mr. Godrej, what you said, this is like so, like, you know, powerful beneath all this, what you're saying, it's so important for us as leaders, as people, as humans to remember, because right now we are in such conflicting times. That's right. What yes. would you say as, you know, we as, and, and especially again, I would say for young people who are figuring this world out, what would you say are some of the things that they should keep in their minds? Following this conversation, what strikes me is we should keep Gandhi in our minds. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think much of Gandhi as an economic thinker. I thought him great as a proponent of nonviolence yeah. and f fighting the right way. He made sure that he didn't commit any blunders by committing crimes. Yeah. And that's why he was nonviolent. But I was quite intrigued that he, had, he influenced my granduncle Ardeshar Godrich to start a business. He influenced the Bajajis to start a business with a very good reputation, very high values. And I didn't realize until we had an MIT alumni event, many Indians went to MIT because one of the Maharajas, I think it was the Maharaja of Bhavnagar, funded many students and his prime minister was a disciple of Gandhi. So they 
provided technical education to many Indians. On the one hand, Gandhi was promoting Khadi, because obviously that's a way of fighting the Manchester cotton industry and helping Indians get livelihoods. But on the other hand, they were developing the future technology of India, which of course Nehru did a lot to help with IIMs, IITs, and now we have all these broad universities like Ashoka, uh, Kriya, Ahmedabad University. So we should always make sure that there is no conflict as we develop our businesses, because that's in the interest of our businesses. And we have a lot to learn from uh, Manmohan Singh, but we also have a lot to learn from Gandhi. <laughs> if you had to look at your life journey so far, what would you say has been one thing that, you know, that has given a lot of purpose and meaning to you personally? I'll talk about two things. Yes. One was a crisis I went through when we set up our project in Gujarat, uh, originally to make um, natural alpha olefins from vegetable oil. Mm. That project faced immediate challenges. And one year our loss was 90 crore. And I had to turn it around. So I had regular meetings with the whole team and uh, we repurposed the project. It was not possible to sell the alpha olefin economically, but our precursor was fatty alcohols. And I wrote a poem about that <laughs> <laughs> turned, called Turn Around at Valia, wow. which explained how I got everyone together and how we started making al alcohol, but we need to fractionate the alcohol to make single cut alcohols and able to market it. There was no great market in India, so we had to market it all over the world. So it was a big challenge. But once we undertook the challenge, the company became profitable again. Right. Yeah. Right. So that was a big challenge. The other was when we went on our sustainability journey. It was my niece, Nisa's idea to call Dasra and FSG to do a project uh, to develop a corporate social responsibility program, which we called Good in Green. And we started this in 2010. And then I was uh, put in charge of it. Of course, we had professionals, we had professional CSR people, but they interact with me. And I found it very exciting. And I found it most exciting because we could do all this, uh, especially when compulsory corporate social responsibility came about, and we could reduce our carbon footprint, reduce our water consumption and our water footprint and our solid waste without affecting our profits wow. because we became much more efficient and uh, our engineers were working on energy efficiency. I quickly approved every energy efficiency project and surprisingly the returns were immense. We were not thinking of saving all these things earlier because we thought it was small amounts of savings. So why bother? We were focusing on expanding our business rather than cutting costs. But here you can be sustainable and cut costs at the same time then green energy started becoming cheaper than whatever electricity rate we were being charged. We started using biomass cogeneration. We make steam and electricity in our factories using biomass, which is very green and it turns out to be cheaper. You know, these are, I'm sure, you know, I asked what's meaningful for you, but it's not meaningful for you, just it's meaningful for everyone. Yes, yes. yes it creates and meaning is, for and everyone. We have to fight climate change yes. faster than we are doing. Yes. And these, at least these low-hanging fruit we should pick up. You know, I was in uh, Germany recently and I was meeting young uh, students and they were saying, oh, even if we do something for climate, India is such a large country and, and, and what is India thinking? And, yes. And, and people all over the world are also thinking about what we are thinking over, yeah. and doing. Fortunately, emissions are low yeah. and we are already going on the path of green energy and the government has further yes. expanded the green energy program but unfortunately they're still going for coal <laughs> which is sad unless they also uh, decide to sequester the carbon dioxide that comes out of the coal sometimes it can be sequestered in the coal mine itself there's a cost to that then we have to decide which is uh, and it's a good base load energy but biomasses also can be used as base. Biomass plants are just like coal plants. In fact, uh, they both come from plants, 
but coal is that <laughs> became fossil fuels <laughs> years ago and now we are taking it out and here we are actually growing the tree sequestering the carbon and then burning it yeah. so yeah. so that we can, and uh, the other thing if we do need a lot of base load energy we shouldn't forget modular nuclear they are safe technologies the new technologies are coming along uh, there are even some large modular plants which are supposed to be very safe and um, not much waste. Uh, so we should look at nuclear also, but we should stop fossil fuels as soon as we can. We have to hear this in a very loud and clear way for all of us, for yes. every, each one of us. And you know, pandemic, Mr. Godrej taught us and showed us that we are also interconnected. We are so interconnected, pandemic also uh, our air quality was very good during the pandemic yeah. uh, because uh, we were using uh, less electricity. Yeah. And that's another advantage of hybrid working. We don't commute so much. Yeah. You know, I, whenever I hear you and listen to you, I always wonder one thing when you talk that, you know, how can you be like such a nice person and such a successful leader <laughs> no, no you could be a successful leader but economics like hardcore like business people are supposed to be you yes know, shrewd also yes of course if you're a nice person it's tougher to be a military leader <laughs> but of course yeah I, I have a funny story to tell when i was in st xavier's college they did a personality test mm. and there was a jesuit father who was the psychologist yeah. And he called me in and he was very worried about me. He said, you tested zero aggression. <laughs> <laughs> he says, how will you survive in life? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, I got a little bit worried about that. But maybe partly because I'm a gold rage, partly because I'm, uh, I'm quite smart. Uh, I never ran into problems. Uh, even when I went to IIT, they had a habit of ragging. But when I went there, I was also fortunate that I stood second in the IIT entrance exam. <laughs> and they had a theory that they would ask questions. If you couldn't ask, answer the questions, they would rag you. <laughs> Fortunately, I could answer all the questions. And in other situations, being nice means nobody really yes. wants to harm you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we have to be like... <laughs> Genius. But you know, but no, listen, but I'm also picking up and this is for everyone listening is that, you know, you could be very nice, you could have zero aggression, and you can still turn things profitable, you can still do so many different things. Absolutely. And be happy. Absolutely. And as I told you, in my crisis situation, I had to call all my team, listen to all of them. And they had wonderful ideas. Yeah. And even if I disagreed with something, I would explain it to them. They would agree. So we did everything by consensus. And I would urge everyone to be as nice as they can. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be firm. Perhaps I'm not firm enough. You can be nice and firm. Yeah, but you know, there's so much. You are giving a lot of comfort to a lot of people out there. Yes. That you can be very nice. Yes. And non-aggressive and it's uh, all Non-aggressive. Right. That doesn't mean you shouldn't confront people. You yes. can always confront people nicely. And also honestly, because if you're honest yes. and transparent, yes. then everything anyways yes. falls in place. And often a good strategy is to confront people with a question. Don't you think it might be better to do it this way? Mm. People don't mind that. But if you tell them, I think it's better to do it this yeah. way, they don't listen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who in your life would you say has, you know, I know it's a very cliched question, but who in your life or who all in your life have very, very deeply influenced you? Uh, people, people in my life. Yes. I think both my mother and my father. My mother was a teacher. And on a centenary, I wrote a poem about my mother and her teaching and the way she taught. And I used to go into her classroom. She used to teach at the Udyachal school over here. Um, and she was an English teacher. And she also took her English class from class five to class 11. Right. And then I suggested she should teach mathematics. So she took a mathematics class from class five to class 11. <laughs> so she got to know those students very well. And she was a part-time teacher. She used to come on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And she used to stick with these students so 
for seven years. So uh, she didn't know the students all that. She knew the students very well. She didn't know a lot of students, but she knew the students very well and they adored her. And at her centennial celebration, they also spoke about her. And I spoke about my experience. Now that I already told you about my father, my brother Adi, because he was already in the business for 13 years before I joined. He's nine years older than me. And over the years, he, he taught me a lot. And he's quite different from me. He's quite firm. He's also uh, very systematic. His desk is cleared by the evening. My desk is full of clutter. <laughs> In fact, when I was studying for the IIT exam, my dad said, with such a cluttered desk, how will you do you well? You got second exam? rank. <laughs> and then there was a time when somebody said, the rank is written on the envelope. And I told him there was some number written on the envelope. I told him my rank is uh, 230. So he said, see, if you had kept your desk tidy, you would have been better. <laughs> Then I told him, when I discovered that my rank was actually second, he said, if you had studied, your rank would have been first, <laughs> if your desk had not been cluttered. <laughs> <laughs> and then wow. I heard somewhere that keeping a cluttered desk is a way of classifying things because you can see everything by sight. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes all different kinds of people and another person, not someone who I encountered in life, were, who influenced me a lot was Antoine Laurent Lavoisier, the father of chemistry. Mm. He's a Frenchman, uh, the father of chemistry, and I share a birthday with him. Mr. Godred, you are such a breath of fresh air and such a reinforcement for all of us and for everyone that you know, you can be a very good person. You know, for me and for all of us, you are a reinforcement that you could, you know, be hatke from the crowd. In Hindi, kehte na hatke and different and and be so good and nice and phenomenal and uh, and deliver such outcomes and and be such a rich person in and out. Because I think that. We, in our pursuit, single dimension pursuit, today I'm just thinking that we are becoming more depressed, more stressed, and we don't know anything. Yes. We are just searching, Google searching for everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, my general knowledge used to be phenomenal and people would always consult me. Now, of course, there's Google. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure people would be still consulting you. If you had to say that, what are one or two wishes that you want, your wishes or goals that you want to accomplish? I would love to make a contribution to preventing climate change. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm a member of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and they are working, uh, I'm on the Executive Council, they are working very hard, so I would like to contribute to them to convince the whole world to solve climate change. Uh, there are lots of problems in the world, uh, inequality, climate change are some of them, authoritarianism, and these are the three topics I addressed in my Ahmedabad uh, convocation. Uh, so I would like to make contributions to these if I can, and of course to the continued growth of our businesses in a sustained and inclusive way. And I would like to urge everyone to have a broad upbringing. Somebody said that your education should be like a tea, a broad top, with one speciality. And somebody else said it should be like a pie, a broad top and two specialties. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe very different ones. Yeah. Wow. So I would urge, I would like to persuade people to do that as well. And last, I would say that India, you know, we are all so proud of the country that we are in. It has its own challenges, ups and downs. You've seen far more. If you had to say to every young Indian today and everyone, like, do you know, what are some of the things that we should look forward to and what are some of the things that we should do? We should look forward to inclusive, steady growth and don't look at what's in it for you, but how can you help society? Yeah. Because that is ultimately gives you the greatest satisfaction. Yeah. And since you are part of society, don't forget yourself either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Mr. Godrej, thank you so much. It's such an honor. Like, you know, I feel like I have lived life like in this conversation and there is such an upliftment of the soul. 
Thank so you. thank you for being such a phenomenal leader from our country. Thank you very much. It was a joy. <laughs>